This is Matthew Cratter's Bitcoin University. Today, I want to talk about how Bitcoin 51% attacks work, how 51% attacks work in general. And tomorrow, this will be a necessary background for tomorrow discussing the Monero situation in a bit more depth. Now, some necessary background. The Bitcoin blockchain is a series of blocks strung together in a certain order, containing all Bitcoin transactions going back to the launch in 2009. We can see all the blocks here. We're currently on block 909845 as I'm recording this. And if you scroll to the right here, you can go all the way back to the Genesis block, block number zero, I believe it is. Sometimes it's number one, or sometimes it's labeled number zero. And if we look inside here, we can see all of the different transactions that are included in the block. So this is the blockchain. It looks like a new block was just mined by Foundry as I'm recording this. Now, everyone who runs a Bitcoin node uses that node to create and verify their own version of the Bitcoin blockchain. Nothing is left to trust or centralized authority. So mempool.space, they have their own node. They calculate everything for themselves and build their own version of the blockchain. Every single node checks every transaction in every block in Bitcoin to see if it's a valid block and valid transaction that follow the Bitcoin rules. If a block follows the Bitcoin rules, that block is added to each node's version of the blockchain. And one of the beauties of Nakamoto consensus, as it's called, is that all these different versions of the Bitcoin blockchain eventually converge to the same common history. But it can take some time for everything to sort itself out. And this is where things can get a little bit tricky. And this is because there are miners all over the world and nodes all over the world. And it takes time for blocks and transactions to be sent from node to node across the world. For example, if mining pool A and mining pool B each mine a different valid block at the same time, then nodes who see mining pool A's new block first will add it to the tip of their blockchain. They'll add it right here at the tip. While other nodes who see mining pool B's new block first will add it to the tip of their blockchain. So which version of the blockchain is the correct one at that point in time? We can't really say we won't know until another new block is mined and placed by nodes on top of either mining pool A's new block or mining pool B's new block. And then in the end, the longest blockchain wins. Technically, the version of the blockchain with the most accumulated proof of work, but in practice, this is usually the longest blockchain. And this longest blockchain is considered the correct and canonical version of Bitcoin's transaction history by all nodes. That's just how the rules are written. There's one other technical detail that really that's really important. Each block in the blockchain contains a hash, in other words, a mathematical condensation, a hash of the previous block. This ensures that the order of the blocks in the blockchain is not altered without people noticing. So let's say you have block 10,000, block 10,001, and block 10,002. That's the order in which they were mined uh, chronologically. If you change any single detail in block 10,000, it completely changes the hash of block 10,000. But block 10,001 uses that hash from block 10,000. So if you change block 10,000, you're going to need to remine block 10,001. But now that you've remined block 10,001, its hash is different. Block 10,002 uses that hash from block 10,001, which is now changed. So now you need to mine block 10,002 again. This is called rewriting the chain. If you change any tiny detail in a block, you're now forced to remine every other block that comes after it. And that takes time. That takes a lot of energy and electricity. Meanwhile, everyone else is working on mining block 10,003 using the hash from block 10,002. So if you want to rewrite the chain in this way, if you want to rewrite the blockchain, you need to be able to quickly mine blocks 10,000 through 10,003 while everyone else is trying to just mine block 10,000. And three. Now, how can you mine four blocks in a row while everyone else is trying to mine one block? You can only do it if you control a very large amount of the computational power of the network. If you control, for example, 30% of the computational power of the network, in other words, 30% of the hash, your mining pool will mine new blocks 30% of the time on average. On average means that may, you may also mine four blocks in a row, or you may go hours or even days, theoretically even weeks without mining a new block. So this is all about the probabilities over time. If you control 50% of the hash rate, you will mine 50% of the blocks over time. If you control 51% of the hash rate, you will mine 51% of the blocks over time. And that's why it's called a 51% attack when an entity acquires 51% of the hash and then uses it to do various things we're going to talk about. I want to pause very, very briefly here to ask you, though, if you're finding this video helpful, please help to support this channel's educational mission. Hit the subscribe button. That does really help. Leave a like, leave a comment, question, suggestion for a future video, and share this video with a friend or family member. 
And that's very important to understand from the outset what these kinds of attacks can and cannot do, these sort of hash rate attacks. They cannot change Bitcoin software code. They cannot create extra Bitcoin that's not allowed by the issuance schedule. They cannot calculate your private key and steal your Bitcoin that way. They cannot delete Bitcoin or steal all of it. All an attacker can do is mine some blocks. Again, these are miners and mining pools. And the more, more computational power they control, the more hash rate they control, the more blocks they can mine. And this is where things get interesting. So if you were in control of a lot of Bitcoin block production as a very powerful miner or mining pool with a lot of the hash, and you were a bad actor, what could you do? You could mine empty blocks, for example, blocks that don't contain any Bitcoin transactions. And by, by doing that, you'll still be collecting the 3.125 Bitcoin reward that comes with each block. You won't be collecting any transaction fees, but that's okay, at least at this point in history, because 99% of the reward, reward comes from this block subsidy rather than coming from transaction fees. So if you control a lot of the hash, you can mine empty blocks. And if a series of blocks in a row are empty, that means that people trying to use Bitcoin are not getting their transactions confirmed. It's essentially a denial of service, a DOS attack. And that's extremely frustrating for users. For example, if you have a payment app that keeps glitching when you try to send money, what are you going to do? You're just going to delete that app and find one that works. So an extended series of empty blocks may cause some people not to want to use Bitcoin or Monero or whatever chain is experiencing this sort of attack. They may not want to use it anymore, especially if the DOS attacks go on for days or even weeks. If you're a hodler and you're not currently transacting or sending Bitcoin or trying to receive Bitcoin, you may not even notice that an attack is underway if you're not on Twitter or X watching this happen. And that's the correct thing to do actually during a 51% attack or even an attack that has 25, 30% of the hash. Just don't transact if you don't have to. Do not send Bitcoin transactions. Just sit on your hands, wait until the attack is over. If an attacker controls 51% of the hash, they will only be producing 51% of new blocks on average. So you'd think that you could just get your transaction mined and included in a block by a miner who's part of the 49% honest miners or mining pools. You certainly could, but here's the catch. Remember when mining pool A and mining pool B both mined a new block at the same time, it was the next block mined that determined whether mining pool A's new block or mining pool B's new block eventually ended up at the tip of the blockchain. And remember again, the longest chain wins, the chain with the most proof of work is considered the canonical one, the right one by all nodes. That's just the rule that uh, Satoshi wrote. So in the process, one block finally ends up in every node's version of the blockchain where we have these competing blocks, but then a block is put on top of one of those chains and that ends up becoming the, uh, the canonical chain. One block finally ends up in every node's version of the blockchain, well, the other block is permanently discarded. It's not part of the longest chain and it disappears. This is what's called an orphan block. And if your transaction was included in this block and then the block gets orphaned, your transaction is no longer part of the blockchain and the history of it being confirmed and included in a block no longer exists. There's a different version of the blockchain. Your transaction is thus no longer confirmed, but it gets spit back out and sent to every node's mempool to be hopefully picked up by a mining pool in the future and included in a block. Now let's say that your Bitcoin transaction was for buying a car. You sent the car dealer a half a Bitcoin and he let you drive off the lot with a new car. Once you saw that transaction get included in a block. Now if that block were to get orphaned, your transaction would then be erased from history and it would be as if that never happened. So now what would that mean? That would mean you would still have the 0.5, the half a Bitcoin in your wallet that you would send to the car dealer because that transaction now never happened. And you'll also have the new car, which is kind of nice. It's not ethical. Um, if the dealer had waited six blocks, your transaction would be buried under so many blocks that it could no longer be written rewritten or dropped from the blockchain. And that number actually is a little longer now. In fact, it's quite a bit longer because we have so much mining pool centralization, but that's something to talk about in another video. But if your dealer had waited a while, that transaction would be buried in the blockchain so that it could no longer be re rewritten or orphaned or dropped from the blockchain. That's why you should always wait six blocks and practice a lot more than that now for large amounts of money for large transactions. But now let's say that you're a malicious mining pool. You go to the car dealer, you send him half a Bitcoin, and then you drive off with a new car after just one block because he allows you to do that. Then you call up your malicious mining pool. 
you tell them to go into overdrive and try to remine that block that included the half of Bitcoin that you sent to the car dealer, if successful, your malicious mining pool will then need to mine every subsequent block as well so that the hash of each block is correct. Remember that rule where each block in the blockchain contains a hash of the previous block. But if your mining pool is successful in doing this, you now have the new car and you get to keep the half of Bitcoin. Now let's extrapolate this to an attack on a crypto exchange or a Bitcoin exchange. Let's say you send $10 million worth of Bitcoin to Coinbase, you quickly dump it for US dollars or US dollar stable coins like USDT, Tether, and then you try to quickly withdraw it. After you get, have it in your hands, after you've withdrawn it, you quickly mine a new block as a malicious mining pool that doesn't include that transaction. And what does that mean? That's very similar to the car situation, the car example. That means that you now have your original $10 million worth of Bitcoin because that transaction no longer exists in the blockchain. Plus you have $10 million worth of US dollars. And so you basically doubled your money. In practice, this is probably not an attack that you'd be able to carry out. In practice, Coinbase will delay your withdrawal, especially if they see funny business happening on chain. If they're smart, they'll wait six blocks or even more if they see that an attack may be underway. Or what will probably happen as well, Tether will probably freeze your $10 million worth of USDT or the bank will freeze your fiat dollars. Even after you receive it into your wallet, uh, Tether can still freeze your USDT. So many of these attacks, they look okay on paper, but they're quite difficult to carry out in real life. This is what's called a double spending attack, even though it's not really double spending. That example where you pay half a Bitcoin for the new car, you remind the block and keep the half of Bitcoin so now you can spend it again on something else. But is this a true example of double spending? This is sometimes confused in the popular media. It's not really because the first transaction, val uh, the first transaction vanishes when that block that contains it gets orphaned. So you'll often see this in the popular press that some Bitcoin has been double spent, but in fact it hasn't. It has not been double spent. After six blocks, everything works itself out and it becomes impossible to rewrite the transaction history of Bitcoin. Why is this? Because you as the attacker would need to remine those six blocks while everyone else is mining one new block. So that's a quick summary of how getting a lot of the hash rate can cause you to wreak, can enable you to wreak havoc on the Bitcoin network, do chain reorganizations. That's where you uh, rewrite part of the chain. They create orphan blocks, uh, orphan transactions, and try to do these sort of attacks where you spend the money and then remind the transaction, remind the block as if the transaction never existed. The probability of being able to remind a certain number of blocks and uh, as an attacker is actually mentioned by Satoshi in the white paper in section 11, where he writes, we consider the scenario of an attacker trying to generate an alternate chain faster than the honest chain. Even if, even if this is accomplished, it does not throw the system open to arbitrary changes, such as creating value out of thin air or taking money that never belonged to the attacker. That's what we were talking about before, the kind of things that these 51% attacks cannot do. Nodes are not going to accept an invalid transaction as payment, and honest nodes will never accept a block containing them. An attacker can only try to change one of his own transactions to take back money he recently spent, as we saw in that example of the car dealer. And then Satoshi goes on to show how you can calculate the probability of someone rewriting the chain like this. That's definitely a large topic and a topic for another video, but I hope tomorrow to cover the whole Monero debacle and talk about what's really happening there. I don't believe it's a true 51% attack. People have been sort of uh, making it seem more drastic than it is, but it is a serious problem for Monero. And we should also talk about to the extent to which Bitcoin is open to similar types of attacks. So hopefully be able to do that in tomorrow's video, but this is necessary background understanding 51% attacks. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.